We're very fortunate today. With us, we have one of the most distinguished men affiliated or people affiliated with our company, but also one of the most highly regarded people in the annals of the US Department of Defense. I can go back to the late 90s when I became, uh, shortly after I became CEO of the company, I started thinking about what should our board look like. And at the time, our board consisted of a whole bunch of uh, guys from the Chicago business community, and which was fairly common at that point in time. And I started looking around at uh, where the company was at, where we wanted to go with the company. And one of the areas of interest for the company had been exploring the defense department. And in the process, I came across three or four different uh, four-star generals. Uh, one day while up at our mobility operation, uh, I expressed to our folks up there, and that business is 100% military business, I expressed my interest in uh, seeking a, a retired general to join our board, and one of the guys yelled out, Ron Fogelman. And of course, I had never heard of Ron, and uh, quickly researched him and said, hey, that would be a pretty interesting uh, guy and um, went ahead and through a couple of series of contacts I uh, was very lucky and uh, reached uh, was able to make a connection and uh, since 2000 uh, Ron has been a, a very valuable member of our board and I brought Ron on as a member of our board to help us gain insight into how the defense markets uh, behaved and where the opportunities might be but what we got was somebody who was far more than just a person with DOD experience. We got uh, a gentleman who uh, understands industry, understands business, uh, is very conversant in uh, across a whole host of um, activities, including return on capital and financial issues, and just really great business sense, as well as great leadership skills. And while he was at the DOD, and his uh, show of hands, how many people at one point in time crossed paths with Mr. Uh, General Fogelman, their military careers. So we have a few here who uh, served underneath him in one way, shape, or another because uh, during his ex extinguished career, which distinguished career, which lasted uh, 34 years, uh, he last served as the uh, chief of staff of the U.S. Air Force. So he was the uh, highest uh, ranked uh, Air Force uh, employee in the United States uh, of America. So. Ron retired on his final tour of duty, as I said, he served as the 15th Chief of Staff of the U.S. Air Force and a member of the Joint Chief of Staff. And from 92 to 94, he was Commander-in-Chief of U.S. Trans Transportation Command, which we refer to as Transcom. As Chief of Staff, he served as a senior uniformed officer responsible for the organization, training, and equipage of 750,000 active duty guard reserve and civilian forces serving the United States and overseas. As a member of the Joint Chief of Staff, he served as a military advisor to the Secretary of Defense, the National Security Council, and the President of the United States. Uh, so we, I consider myself very fortunate, and we should consider ourselves very uh, lucky to have Ron Fogelman with us here today. This is the second part of a series of um, uh, having an opportunity to introduce our board members to our employee base, our employee base to our board members. Uh, back in April, uh, Cheryl arranged for Jennifer Vogel, our uh, most recently uh, elected uh, board member, to share her thoughts on leadership and business and women in business and so on. And I thought what we would do today is ask uh, General Fogelman to share with us his thoughts on leadership and um, how he uh, achieve what he achieved, how he was able to successfully motivate 750,000 people and get them to work together towards a common goal. And I'm hopeful that one of your takeaways, uh, you know, you can leave here maybe learning a thing or two and gaining a pearl of wisdom in terms of how to go ahead and apply some of what he's experienced into your uh, daily routine. And uh, I will ask uh, the general make a couple of opening comments and then We'll follow it up with a q and A. I have a few questions I'll ask him, and then we can open up to the floor for questions as well. So if I may, General Fogelman, it's a pleasure. Well, thank you. Thank you, David. Um, the first thing I would say about uh, the biography and uh, 
the one thing you have to remember is the the beginning of that first Star Wars movie. You remember how the script was unfolding and it said long ago and far away in another galaxy. So, okay, I, I don't live in that galaxy. I live today, but uh, what I learned when I was in that galaxy is uh, a little bit about leadership. And the first thing I learned was that um, anybody can be a leader. By my definition, leaders are people who make things happen. Hopefully good things, but they are people who step out. You do not need rank on your shoulders. You don't need a position title. Remember that down in your organizations, you will find people who are leaders and, and you yourself. Leaders are people who make things happen. Now, if you happen to have rank, or you happen to have position in an organization, then leadership is mandatory. It's mandatory. And, and so what do leaders do? How do they go about this? And uh, you know, my, I, I think they, they have a responsibility to do a couple of things. One, they provide vision. They provide vision for the organization. They develop goals. Uh, for the organization, and I discovered that when you do that, sometimes you get a lot more success if the organizational goals are somewhat aligned with the individual goals or the goals of the individuals within the organization. And uh, we can talk a little bit more about that if, if you'd like some clarification. Third thing, leaders must execute. I discovered in the United States military that the troops will forgive just about anything in a leader except a failure to lead, a failure to execute, because that's, that's why you have the position. And then finally, I think the greatest responsibility for a leader is to grow the next generation of leaders. They've got to work on that, got to nurture it. It's got to be an objective right up front. So the vision, if you, uh, in a vision, this is where you really sort of give the goals and state the expectations for the organization. What you personally want out of your leaders, your managers, whoever they are. And in the United States Air Force, we developed uh, to help do that a set of what we called core values. These are the things that we wanted our people to understand. Um, when I became the chief, the Air Force had seven core values. I couldn't recite any of them. I, I'm a three-pronged brain guy, you know. If, so whatever you do, keep it simple as you, as you do this. And so, uh, in, uh -oh. <laughs> uh -oh. <laughs> in the Air Force, uh, we had three core values. Service before self, integrity in all that you do, and excellence in our execution. And then I'll close and, and, and go to the questions. During my tenure, as I went out and I spoke to the troops, and particularly as I spoke to my subordinates and what I expected out of leaders in the United States Air Force, I, I had four pass-fail pass rules. And the first one was, no rule through fear. You've all seen the leader who's, uh, you know, slams things, bangs things, and, and uh, tries to get you to do his or her will uh, through fear for your job, just fear of embarrassment, all this. No rule through fear. That was rule number one. The second one was, never lose your temper in public. This was a little basic thing. And my philosophy on that, my thought process was, hey, if you can't control yourself, and you don't have control over your emotions, et cetera, in public, how can I entrust an organization to you to control. So you have to have a little self-discipline, if you will. Uh, the third was zero toleration. 
zero toleration for harassment or discrimination or prejudice based on race, religion, ethics, age, anything. This was a rule, from my perspective, not because it was the law of the land, but because it made sense from a mission accomplishment standpoint. If you are an individual and you are, be, are being harassed or you are in a hostile environment, you are never going to be able to achieve your full potential. And you get manpower based on X number of bodies to do whatever the job is. And if some leader takes one or two of those people out of, out of productive work by beating them down and harassing them, you're undercutting the whole organization. That's the philosophy behind that. And finally, my last one was, you know, you just try to demonstrate, and I'm, I'm, I'm not a Pollyannish guy. Um, when it comes time to get into heaven, there may be some real tough negotiation. <laughs> but the fact of the matter is, where, when it comes to your organization and your people, you really do have to sort of lead a life, if you will, that's based on integrity, on trust, and on loyalty. And loyalty up the chain to the people above you, which is generally pretty easy to do, but loyalty down the chain so that your troops know that if somebody above them is, is beating up on them because of something that they think they did or didn't do, you've got an obligation to stand up and say, sir, let me tell you, this is, this is what my troops have done. So those are some basic rules of the road. I'll stop now. And uh, David, over sure. to you and or whoever. Let, let me start if I may. Uh, Ron, how did you hone your leadership skills and how much thought went into developing your leadership skills? Well, I used to tell people, I did it one day at a time with one experience at a time. You know, as a youngster, I was a fighter pilot. I led a pretty carefree life. But even there, I was observing the leadership. And there were some folks that I looked at and said, I don't want to ever, ever be like that person. And there were others that I said, that's a pretty cool individual. And, and they're cool because ding, 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 and ding. So I'd like to emulate that. So, so there was uh, one day at a time. But there was another way. I'm, I'm not an engineer. I'm, I'm a historian. And in understanding military leadership, one of the things that I found to be extremely valuable was I read biographies, a lot of biographies of military leaders through the years. And um, by reading those biographies, you, you could sort of uh, benefit from the mistakes and the, uh, and the good actions of people who went before you. Now, um, I believe that leaders can be developed, that you can train people, you can give them skill sets. But I'm question, I question some of these books that are out there, you know, I mean, I, I used to buy all these little books, uh, you know, uh, Lincoln's words on leadership, uh, Genghis Khan's seven approaches to diplomacy, you know, those kinds of things. <laughs> uh, and uh, s some of them were pretty good and some not so good. But, uh, but I, I learned a lot from reading biographies. Very good. When, when you think about uh, leadership, of course, you need to think about motivation. How do you motivate a team? What goes through your mind when you think about getting a team excited about performing a mission and accomplishing a mission? Well, uh, I think one of the keys to motivation is, uh, is communications. And you, before you can motivate somebody to do something, I think they have to understand why. You know, what's the, where does it fit within the larger scheme of things? Why is it important? And, uh, and so, uh, to me, 
uh, motivation had, a, this goes back to the four uh, points of leadership, it, it had a lot to do with, with making sure that the, that the folks knew what you were going to ask them to do was important and um, how much time you had to do it, what the resources were, and, uh, and, and what, the, uh, what the consequences of success or failure were going to be. And so if you do that, uh, you can, I think, motivate people to, to do. I, people need to believe in something higher than themselves. That's my philosophy, whether it's uh, in the culture of the AAR or whether it's in the ethos of the U.S. military or what it is. And, and sometimes people get so uh, wrapped up trying to you know, do whatever the task is that they have to be reminded that they're part of a really larger enterprise that's very important. And leaders have to step back and take the time to to do that, I think. So Ron, you, you've had success in the uh, military world, you've had success in the commercial world. Uh, so some would argue that leading in the military world is very different than leading, let's say, in a uh, commercial sense, that uh, the chain of command is different and uh, the need to respond may be different. So what have you seen, I mean, in terms of leadership skills that you've honed uh, through your 34 year military career and then adapting those or trying to come over to the commercial world. What, what do you see as the major differences, challenges and? Well, uh, clearly, um, I think that um, the environment uh, to lead in the military may be one in which it's um, almost easier and I say it for this reason. Um, due to a national policy decision made back in the, in the 1970s, this country decided it was going to do away with the draft. It was going to do away with universal service. And so that means that every man and woman in the United States military is a volunteer. They're there because they chose to be there. Now, the United States military is a very different part of uh, the American landscape in the sense that it's so different that the Congress of the United States gave the military its own code of law. It's called the Military Code or the uh, Uniform Code of Military Justice. And so not only does a member of the military have to abide by all the rules that everybody else does, they've got a very specified set that they have to abide by. And so, um, as a leader, you know that these people, at least in theory, have signed up to those rules. Additionally, within the military, you have certain customs and courtesies that, that by virtue of being there, you're, you're part of. You salute. You stand up when a superior comes into the room. You do these, these are little customs and courtesies and mores. And, and so, as a leader in the military, you start with the basic assumption that that individual wants to be there. He or she wants to be there, and they're interested in what, what the purpose of the organization is. And the purpose of the United States military, soldiers, sailors, airmen, Marines, Coast Guardsmen, all those services have one purpose in life, and that is to fight and win America's wars. To fight and win America's wars. They are not social actions agencies. They are not employment agencies. They exist for one reason. And so, from time to time, we must remind people that is our purpose. We have to remind ourselves and we have to remind others. And so, when you're in that kind of an environment, uh, the idea of obeying and following, and it's called good order and discipline, you need that. 
In the civilian world, it's a little bit different. And so the first thing that a military individual, man or woman, needs to understand about transitioning to the civilian world is it's different, okay? Now, generally, you are in an organization because you want to be there, but what it takes for you to personally separate from that organization and go somewhere else is a lot less complex than it is in the military, with a lot less uh, dire consequences. And so if you're going to lead, it's, a, it's, a, it's where you're trying to lead the willing and the knowing. And once you put that into your mind, uh, then you begin, I think, to apply the same rules. And you accept people for being there because they want to achieve what it is that it are the goals and objectives. They want to, you're in AAR because I think AAR has a unique culture. And, and you, you come to like that culture. You desire that culture. If you didn't, and somebody else down the road had something that appealed to you more, you would go there. So you have to understand, I think, the basic motivation of folks, and then it's the same thing. You give them vision, you give them goals. You demonstrate um, how you can move forward. I think that's, that's the simple thing, David. I have one last question, then we'll ask uh, folks in the audience to come up with questions. Uh, my, my last question to you, Ron, would be, uh, what, what would you have considered to be your greatest leadership challenge? Hmm. Toughest Le decision. Leading the board of directors at AAR. <laughs> <laughs> Ron is our lead director, so. <laughs> no. Um, I, I think, first of all, I lived a charm life. You know, I mean, I, you know, I came out of the hill country in central Pennsylvania. I'm the first kid in my family to go to college. Uh, I joined the military because somebody told me you could retire at 20 years on half pay. <laughs> Sounded pretty good to me. And then I screwed it up and overshot in a vertical. <laughs> and, uh, and so uh, anyway, um, the challenges that go with taking care of the troops when you don't have the resources that you know you need to get the job done. Um, my last three jobs in the military were joint jobs. I was the deputy commander in chief of US forces in Korea, I was the commander in chief of the United States Transportation Command, and I was the chief of staff of the Air Force. So I was dealing with people from all the services. And as I would travel around the world, I would ask soldiers, sailors, airmen, Marines, what can we, the leadership in Washington, be doing for you troops out here? And they normally had three answers, three, three elements to their answer. They said, first, sir, don't ask us to leave our families and go into remote places of the world unless the job is important. If it's important, that's, that's good enough for us. The second thing is, while we're gone, take care of our families. Look after our families. Make sure they have decent housing. Make sure that they're looked after. And the third thing was always, you know, if we go do it and we come home, it would really be nice if somebody said thanks. You know, very simple. It came from all of them. And on those occasions where I was in positions where I was trying to take care of the troops or get a job done, where I either uh, could not get the assets that we needed or could not get the support for something we were doing, were for me personally the most challenging in the sense of, of when I felt less fulfilled as a leader and as a greater failure was uh, kind of taking care of the troops. Uh, and that, that involves uh, 
really kind of understanding where resources come from and how you, you know, how you go get them. You, the, the thing you cannot allow to have happen is you run into a situation like that and you say, well, woe is me. The system's, you know, system's screwing us over. We're not going to, no, nah, no, nah, come on. You got to step up and you got to try and work the problem and try to find the resources, try to do this. Don't default to, well, it's somebody else's fault. They didn't give me this, they didn't give me that. So that's... We call that no victims. No victims, okay. Yeah. Folks? Up here, I got one. Oop. We'll, we'll take, well, you go ahead, David. You're the moderator. Steve, go ahead. Uh, what the question is? What readers would I, or what leaders would I recommend reading about? Uh, I think the the um, greatest, single greatest military leader of the tw 20th century was General George Catlin Marshall. Okay, General Marshall uh, was chief of staff of the army. He later went on. This was a man who went on to be. Secretary of Defense and Secretary of State after the Second World War. He was responsible for the Marshall Plan that helped the recovery of Europe after the Second World War. Um, so he would be one that I would uh, certainly spend some time reading on. I, I mean, there's a whole, you, you, you um, uh, Patton, you know, one kind of leadership designed for getting a job done, uh, certainly Patton. There's been some, uh, uh, well, there's been some good biographies on Lincoln and, you know, how to, how to manage a very diverse, you know, group of advisors. And, um, and Eisenhower, um, the more I read about Eisenhower, the more I am impressed with what he did after the war than I am with what he did during the war. Eisenhower, as the president, made some real monumental decisions that, uh, that were uh, quite impactful as it went down. So I could go through uh, a, a lot of those uh, kinds of folks. I think that you would be well served to read, um, read Martin Luther King's um, biographies. Because here was a man who certainly changed the world uh, with a new approach. And um, so not all, not all the leaders that we need to know and, and uh, read about have to be, uh, not that Martin Luther King isn't a heroic person, but he uh, wore, wore uniforms and you know, commanded large forces. Churchill, gosh, what? Man, you got to read about Churchill. This guy was something from the very beginning all the way through. You know, he was really something. Smoked, smoked cigars and drank whiskey, right? Well, he's, he's got two of the great virtues of, uh, <laughs> of a wartime leader. So, you know, it's not all bad. But uh, any, anyway, uh, so uh, those are some of them that I would throw out there. And I, I'll tell you, by and large, I've read the Jack Welshes and, you know, that kind of stuff. Uh, yeah, you know. And, okay. Have you considered writing a book? Uh, I have not. There, I, there's no uh, great audience out there with bated breath waiting for the Ron Fogelman book, <laughs> except maybe my granddaughter, and she told me she's willing to wait a long time. So. <laughs> Hi, Ron. Name's Lou with the Allen Group. Um, a lot of team members will typically have strengths and weaknesses. When a task comes up, how do you decide between putting the best person on the job on the task or the person who stands to develop the most doing the task? Okay. That, that's a very, um, I may not answer your direct question, but I'll, you know, I'll, I'll take it from another perspective. What I discovered in the military, see, uh, you don't get a lot of choice about who you get dealt to you as troops in your organization. You know, there's a big bureaucracy, they assign people and whatever. Um, and what I discovered is that 
not everybody is equally good at everything. And um, so what you have to discover in a group, if you have them, is who is good at this task and who is good at that task. And what I really discovered is if A is good at task one and B is good at task two, don't give B task one, okay? Because, you know, it's a little bit like uh, trying to teach pigs to dance. You know I mean? You frustrate the pigs and you mess up the dance hall. So, um, <laughs> but the fact of the matter is, uh, the way I used to talk about this is, <laughs> when I was a young man, you know, I drove racy cars and had motorcycles and everything, and I had a toolbox where I knew where every wrench was and what it was worth and all that. Then my wife and I had children, and they turned out to be two boys, and they became teenagers. And my toolbox kind of became disorganized a little bit. And so when they left home, I decided I was going to police that toolbox up and get it back in shape. And in my toolbox, I discovered a half a pair of pliers. Now you look at a half a pair of pliers and you say, this is worthless, I ought to throw that away. Now, it turned out that at that particular point in our lives, Miss Jane was going through her Cadillac phase, okay? My wife, Miss Jane. And in those days, Cadillacs had these wheel covers that had about 40,000 grippy things on them. And the perfect thing to pry those off was a half a pair of pliers. That beauty just popped those hubcaps right off there. Well, let me tell you, every now and then, in an organization, you're going to end up with a half a pair of pliers. It's going to be somebody that's a half a pair of pliers. And, and <laughs> the secret is to recognize what you can get out of the half a pair of pliers. And so, you know, that's, uh, that's sort of a crude way, but I mean, that's, <laughs> I, always, I always look to get the best use out of the best people. And, and by the way, the other thing is, look, People in organizations know who are good, and I almost used the phrase, who are, who are truly good and who are good at looking, uh, looking good on the first tee. Did I clean that up? Yeah, I like that. <laughs> Normally I say, you got to watch out for those people who try to look good in the shower. You know, they're posing. <laughs> The people who are trying to look good in the first tee. You know, the dynamics in your organizations, people know that. People know who the suck up is. People know who the people are who get the job done. This is a little bit like participation awards for sports for our kids. Now, if you got a champion, put the champion forward. But recognize that everybody else has got a role to play too. You know, that's my role, that's my, that's my view. Very good answer. Yes, sir. Do you have a story uh, from your past uh, that truly exemplified leadership that really comes to mind and uh, just pops uh, for you? You mean uh, something I personally did or? Something that you personally did or one of your team members had done uh, that really stood out? Um, boy, you put me in. You put me in a, a tough situation because I want to tell one of my favorite stories about me, but I, I, I want to also think about, uh, so I'll tell two stories. How's that? <laughs> the first story is when I graduated from the United States Air Force Academy and became an officer in the Air Force, I had lived four years within this sort of cloistered life and, and one of the basic tenets of, uh, of life at the academies is an honor code. And the honor code is very simple. It says, I will not lie, steal, cheat, nor tolerate among us those who do. Okay? And so I had lived that. And I had watched people fall by the wayside who couldn't live by that. And so I got out into the military and uh, I was in my first assignment where I was teaching people to fly. And I had this one, and I was a lousy flight instructor. I mean, 
<laughs> my philosophy was flying is a God-given right, and if you can't do it, ain't nothing I can do to help you. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ride around with you and let you demonstrate that, you know, you can do this, and if you can't, I'm probably going to throw you out because you shouldn't be here, see, so. And so I didn't graduate a lot of students, but anyway. <laughs> but this particular kid was a really great pilot, and, uh, you know, so I soloed him, I, you know, I sign off on his solo, that he can go off, he can go up and go out in the area, do things, and then come back and shoot patterns. And then, and then I signed off, and then I went and got another student, and I was out in the area. And the worst thing you want to hear is, you know, they come up on guard channel and they say, oh, all aircraft flying out of Vance Air Force Base, return to the pattern, we have an aircraft down, uh, you know, and they're trying to figure out what aircraft it is and who it is. In my heart, as soon as I heard that, I knew it was that kid. And so, poof, I beam back to the field, I get on the field, and uh, it turns out it was that kid. <laughs> and uh, and he, uh, he was being flown back to the base in a helicopter. And so I met him when he got off the helicopter. I said, what happened? What happened? And he said, well, sir, um, I got up there and I did all the things I was supposed to do and I had some time left over and I had never flown inverted. And so I wanted to try to fly inverted. And he said, I was flying along inverted and I got in a cloud deck and I got disoriented. And, and you, you, you have told all of us students, if you're ever in doubt, that airplane is worth about $65 junk, you punch out and I'd rather have you alive and the aircraft gone. So yeah, I, I've always said that. So, so you come out of the cloud deck and you're inverted and uh, you, you punch out and you swing twice and hit the ground, right? Oh no, he said, I, I come out of the cloud deck in the parachute and I could see Oklahoma City and I <laughs> Man, this is not good. So what happens is the system decides that they're gonna throw this kid out of pilot train. And in order to throw him out, I was asked to write a, a, a grade slip that said, this guy had a fear of flying. Because, you know, if you put down fear of flying, you're gone. And, and I went to my, my boss, who was a many time passed over. In other words, he had, he had failed to be promoted for whatever reason, uh, a captain. And I went to him and I said, sir, I, I cannot do this. It's not true. It's just the opposite. This kid was an aggressive flyer. And I, I'm sorry, but I, I can't do this. And, and this guy, who probably had one more shot at maybe getting promoted, said, you're absolutely right, Ron, and I will take care of this. And so he stepped in. And that, that showed me something about taking care of your troops. So that was, that to me was true leadership. Uh, the selflessness thing. Now, the other thing you look for are opportunities every now and then to break a log jam. So when I was a four-star general, and I was commander of the U.S. Transportation Command, we were trying to bring on this new airplane. It was called the C-17. And uh, it had a lot of problems in the early days, and so it was getting close congressional uh, scrutiny and they had put milestones, you know, if you don't do this by this, we're going to cut off the money and all this. So one of the milestones is that we had to complete the certification of this airplane for parachuting by one June of such and such a year. And um, we were moving towards that, and about March of that year, the United States Army Parachute Test Team, which was out at Edwards to do this, refused to jump out of the airplane. They said, uh, we're getting small rips in our parachutes and we think it's caused because the chutes are colliding with the fuselage and all this and, and so we, it's a safety, we're not gonna jump. Well, I had been a fighter pilot that got sort of dumped on these airlift guys and I didn't really know. So I called all these guys in and I said, talk to me about 130s and 141s and all this. And they said, sir, occasionally shoots hit the fuselage in all those airplanes. This is nothing different. So I ended up, I called 
the Army Three Star who was in charge of the 18th Airborne Corps at Fort Bragg. He later became chairman of the Joint Chiefs. I said, you, you know, there's nothing wrong with this. And if these guys don't jump, we're not going to, you know, we're going to seriously jeopardize the whole program. Because people were starting to come up, as you all know, they come up with these wonderful ideas. Well, maybe if we put a hydraulic door that comes out, that'll fix it. You know, well, you only have to basically redesign the airplane to do that, but hell, what, you know, maybe we can do that. So anyway, there's all this. So I, I called this guy and I said, you, there's nothing wrong with this. And he says, Ron, you know this and I know this. But he says, I cannot order those guys to jump out of that airplane because it's a safety of flight thing. So I said, okay, why don't you and I go out and jump out of it? Okay? And he said, I think that'd be a great idea. And so I started going home at lunch and putting on my combat boots. And I was a rated parachutist, but I hadn't jumped for a while. And uh, my wife, Miss Jane, just thought I was trying to get in shape. She, she didn't have seen it. Until the day came for me to go down to Fort Bragg because I had to go down there and I had to get recurrent uh, in jumping. And so I couldn't find my dog tags, which the Army had that as a stipulation. You had to wear dog tags, you couldn't jump out of an airplane. So I'm running around the house grousing about my dog tags, and finally Miss Jane says, why do you want your dog tags? I said, I just need them. And she said, you're going to go jump. And I said, yeah, that's true. And uh, so anyway, I got my dog tags, I go off, and it was a great experience. You know, first thing happens, I get down there, they issue me one of these ramrod straight, master sergeant, jump this, jump that, baseball cap just right. And you can tell he is not shot in the backside about screwing around with this four-star general, you know. But anyway, we go through all that. I get recurrent. I go out. And we jump. And when we jump at Edwards, I went out the right door. He went out the back door. And we, hold, we had the whole Army parachute test team behind us. We got on the ground, General Sheldon called them together and said, hey look, this shoot thing is not being caused by the C-17. We're seeing it. We changed manufacturers and, and you know, we just have some def you know, little defects. It's happening. That was the end of it. But that was a case where, you know, you can't order people to do something you're not willing to do yourself. So, anyway. Very good. Tim? Brian, could you talk a little bit about, uh, about your time in Washington, D.C., where, where you had to interact with the, the political environment and, and sure. uh, how, how that was for you? Yeah. Um, I, I never had a tour in the Pentagon until I was a colonel. I was an operator. I flew airplanes, and I had a lot of flying time. So I went to the Pentagon as a colonel for two years, and then poof, I was back out into ops for a few years. Then I went back in the Pentagon, and I was there for four years as a, a programmer in the air staff, and I had very little interface. I mean, I had to go over a couple of times and testify in Congress, but, but by and large, I was sort of shielded from that. And then when I went back for my last job, poof, I'm in the middle of it. And when I was at Transcom, I, was, I had to go testify and all that. And um, it was, there was no doubt in my mind when I got told at Transcom that I was going to go be the chief of staff of the Air Force, that from a quality of life standpoint, I was taking a step, step back. I mean, I was at Scott Air Force Base. I was the only four-star in the base. I was God, you know, I mean, <laughs> you know. Somebody mowed my lawn. You know, I always had a car there in the morning, had a security detail. Life was good. And now I'm going to go to Washington. You know, life ain't going to be so good. But anyway, part of it was a mindset. I, I, I just said, okay, uh, this is now my job. My job is to interface with, the, you know, politicians, political appointees, and all this good stuff. And so um, I found it. Uh, like any other job, there were rules of the road, challenges, and this. And I, and I would give you, see, I went back there, um, 
I, I was a sink at the end of Bush the Elder's tour, and so, you know, I was involved with the White House and the folks in that area. And then when I went back to be the chief, um, Clinton was the president. And, um, and I would tell you this. There, there's a lot of things that, you know, happened during the Clinton administration that I would, I would not hold up as paragons of virtue or whatever. But as the commander in chief, President Clinton was a very good commander in chief. Never served in the military, but when we would go into uh, the tank or we would go over to the White House for a meeting, he always showed up very well informed. He asked really good questions. And in the main, uh, he took military advice. And so if we didn't like the way things turned out, all we had to do was look in the mirror. Uh, relations with the Hill um, uh, were, I thought, uh, it, there's an art to that, but, uh, but you know, in those days, and this was, you know, almost 20 years ago, there was a, there was a lot less acrimony between the parties, and you respected the people who were serving, uh, because uh, the ones you dealt with in the national security committees really had the best interest of the nation at heart. And um, I read my job description but when I went to Washington uh, to be chief of staff. It's actually in the law, Title 10, and it says uh, the primary job of the chief of staff of the services is to provide military advice to the Secretary of Defense, the National Security Council, and the President. And so that was my job. I, I always took the approach. I wasn't there because I was the fastest guy in the block or the best looking guy. I was there because somebody thought that I could give military advice. And so I, I stayed until I thought people didn't value my military advice anymore and then I left. But, but that was what it was all about. So it was not not that uncomfortable. Yeah. Okay, why do you call your wife Miss Jane? Oh. <laughs> and um, how has she impacted your leadership yeah. skills? Well, first of all, um, Miss Jane and I um, grew up in the same hometown, and uh, we didn't start dating until high school. We have a picture of us together when we were five years old at a Baptist uh, or at a Mennonite uh, Bible school. Back in those days, they didn't have child care. So what my mother would do during the summer to get me out of the house is I would go to Methodist Bible school, and then I would go to, you know, and it went like that for about three weeks. But anyway, so Miss Jane has been a very big part of my life. And uh, uh, the reason she is called Miss Jane is many years ago, we were stationed with some friends, an army colonel and his wife, and their daughter could not say Fogelman. It was just, and they were from the South. And so the lady asked, said, look, in the South, it's permissible for a young child to call somebody Miss so-and-so, so is it okay if she calls you Miss Jane? And so that's where it started, and then it caught on. Other people... And here was the value of it as we went up through the ranks. As we went up through the ranks, um, it turns out that nobody wants to talk to the general's wife. Nobody wants to talk to Mrs. Fogelman. But everybody will spill their guts to somebody called Miss Jane. Okay? And, and so we were a team as we went around places I would go look at operational issues, I would look at this, and she would go work family issues. And so, Miss Jane is, to this day, what she's known as in the military. And, uh, and so, there was another part of it that I had never thought about. What it did for her is it gave her her own identity. She was not tied to me. Miss Jane was a force upon, you know, in and of herself, and it worked very well. 
So, how long are you married? We just passed uh, 53 years. Nice. Yeah. Okay. Got time for a couple more questions? Yes, sir. Okay, the question is, what is the most common mistake that you see leaders make, um, whether it's in the commercial world or uh, uh, in the civilian, or in the military? I, I think, I, I don't know if I would call this a common mistake, but uh, uh, the thing that causes more difficulty, I think, for leaders in both places is uh, either an inability or a failure to communicate whether it's articulating what the vision is or the goals or whatever, or it's just sitting down and giving mission task orders. Our mission today is to take that hill and we can't do this, but we can do that. It's, I'm sure it's the same in business, you've seen it. Uh, you know, somebody comes in and says, well, they want us to do such and such, and they don't say, and they want us to do it by eight o'clock yesterday, you know, sort of thing. I mean, it's, so communications, I think, um, I used to tell people, you know, when you're, when you're chief of staff of the Air Force, uh, there's a body of 750,000 people out there that are supposedly, you know, in one way or fashion, you're responsible for. And every now and then, uh, somebody will do something really, really, really stupid. And, and uh, it embarrasses the service, and whatever. And the way I used to handle that is I used to remind myself that nobody, nobody in that 750,000 people got up that morning and said, how can I screw up Fogelman's life today? <laughs> they, something happened, whether it was miscommunication or something, and they did something and they screwed up Fogelman's life that day. But they weren't, they didn't start out to do it. And, and so you have to remember that in the context of how you deal with people, but it's also uh, communication, very important. Ron, you've been on the AAR board now for 16 years. Yeah. You're our longest serving outside board member. What do you, how do you, when you look, when you think about AAR, when you leave today after spending a couple of days, what, what do you see as our strengths and what do you see as our weaknesses? What comes well, to mind? Yeah. Um, well, I, I think our strength is also not necessarily a weakness, but our biggest challenge from the board's perspective. Look, AAR has been a public company for 60 years. Public company since 67. Okay, so. It's been in existence for 60 years, 61 yeah, years. Yeah, so this is a public company that in its history has had two CEOs, you know, Ira and you. I, I don't, I, I, would, I would be willing to bet you'd be hard pressed to find another public company that's had that kind of continuity in leadership. And I'm not blowing smoke, but I, I, I have watched David through thick and thin and through a lot of times. So um, one of the greatest strengths I think that, that we have in the company is we have at the highest level of leadership a person of integrity who cares about, about you all, who cares about shareholders, who cares about the reputation of the company. So that's a challenge, or that's, that's a, a, a great attribute. The challenge is to make sure, as a board, that we have a successor that's fully qualified and ready to go. Now, we have a succession plan we're working on and all that, and, and I think it's, it's good. We're moving down in the right direction. But it is, you know, uh, when you become a member of a public board, they tell you, well, your number one uh, goal in life is to take care of the shareholder. Take care of the shareholders. Lots of ways you do that. Stock price, no inside dealing, all these things. But the the most important way you can take care of the shareholders and the, and the company is to make sure, as a board, that you work 
to have the absolute best leadership that you can. And, and so uh, I've been very proud to tell people through those 16 years or so that, I've, that I am associated with AAR Corporation. And that has, that has cachet out there among the public that deals in aerospace matters. You, you can feel good about the fact that that's on your resume, or you can feel good that you have dedicated your life to making this, uh, this happen. Time for one more question. Yes, uh, Don. Let me get Don, we'll have two. Don, please. Mine, David, mine's more of a comment okay. for the group here. Um, <clears throat> This probably goes back to the suck up comment you made earlier, but <laughs> I've, I've known General Fogelman since 1970 when I took history from him at the Air Force Academy, uh, and we've crossed paths many times. I, I want the people at AAR to understand how fortunate we are to have board members of this caliber uh, at AAR Corporation. Um, I've known every Air Force Chief of Staff in a personal sense, I mean, I either worked for him or whatever for the last 25 years. So I've known every, every chief during that time frame. And I will tell you that within the United States Air Force and the community that surrounds it, no single chief is more revered than this man. And that's, you know, that's a fact. You can ask anybody. I know Randy, Randy's here nodding his head. He's aware of that as well. So I just want, want you all to understand how fortunate we at AAR are to have the board members that we do. Thank you. Dan, Dan, one second. If I may, because I think this is helpful, what would you point to as the attributes that set General Fogelman apart from others, let's say, and, and makes him as special as you identify? What were the key characteristics? He, he lives his credo. Okay, he lives his credo. And I can give you a, a number of examples over many years that I've observed, but um, what, what he says, he does. That, that's, that's it. Geez, I, I was hoping you would talk about my humility. <laughs> <laughs> I, I work on that with my granddaughter and Miss Jane all the time, and I'm not making much progress. Work. <laughs> Thanks. General, my question is actually related to the, the statement that you made earlier about Marshall, and, and that's one of the, the leaders that I've read about. I recall in one of his biographies, one of the, the details that was brought out on him was with his brother, I think his name was Stuart, if I remember correctly, and he talked about how what motivated him was not because he was the best student or he goes, it was, but because Stuart always beat him. Yeah. And at one point he overheard the conversation between Stuart and his mother and he decided he was gonna, he was gonna beat his brother. Um, as we look at what we have from a leadership perspective with David, what we've seen with the contributions of Mike and, and others, as leaders and, and as expectations are set for us, what do you see as those motivational characteristics that you would like us to take within AAR and really espouse to our teams to build that next generation? Is it that it's not that there that we, we can't do it kind of things, or are there, are there other aspects that in your experience are truly motivational for the people around us. Yeah. I, you know, I would almost go back um, to the Air Force uh, core values in a sense, um, particularly when I talk about uh, or think about integrity and excellence. Um, look, this company is involved in the aerospace business. The parts that you catalog and deliver uh, to a, an airline. Um, you're certifying things when you do that. And the end result is falsification or sloppy work could result in a tragedy. Uh, and so every now and then you got to remind the folks on the line there or in the warehouse that what they're doing isn't just important in the sense of moving apart from A to B, but somebody put trust in them. 
the customer put trust in them. That had to be built over time. And so there's this reputation for integrity and excellence. And so I would, you know, it sounds almost Pollyannish in this era to talk about these kinds of things, but they're important. I mean, look, man, I used to go out there and strap on the greatest fighters in the world. I flew F-15s, F-16s, A-10s. And, and my life depended upon that crew chief who handed me the forms to review and I got on that airplane and I was gonna go fly. So um, you gotta think about it in that larger context, if you will. The other thing, and, and I, I trust that you won't be faced with this often, but once or twice in your life, you're going to face a situation where you're going to have to, you know, your option might be, well, I could lie about this, I could fudge about it, or I can just tell the truth and get on with it and take the consequences. When George Marshall was uh, coming up through the ranks as a colonel at the end of the First World War and during the 1920s and 30s when, you know, uh, he, would, he would take note if he were somewhere at an exercise or something, he had a little black book, and he would write in that book something about the people he had observed that day. And so when the Second World War came, and we did this great mobilization, he had friends that were serving generals that he told had to go home, because they weren't up to the challenge of the new era. It was, in some ways, his challenge of the millennials, okay, only they weren't millennials, if you will. And so somebody asked him one time, in that book, when you write down attributes of future leaders, what's the number one attribute that you put in there? What is the number one thing you're looking for? And he said, courage. Not valor on a battlefield, but the courage to do what is right when you were challenged. And so, to me, that's a, a kind of a, a message for a workforce that's involved in the kinds of things that we do, we at AAR. Um, it's an important, important aspect. David? Sir, I want to thank you so much for your time today. I want to thank you for your service to our great country. I want to thank you for your service to AAR. So thank you very well, much. Well, thank you. And, and thank you for what you do.